And the first question is, um, can you tell me how local anesthetics work, please? Mm -hmm. Local anesthetics are drugs that um, stop conduction of action potentials along the nerve membranes. Um, they do that by entering the axillary membrane through the sodium channel. Um, it's only the unionized fraction of the drug that is able to do that. Once it's in the axoplasm, it gets proteinized and ionized and attaches itself to the internal surface of the sodium channel and inactivates that channel. Um, this stops all conduction down that nerve and causes loss of motor function and sensory function, and that is reversible. Okay, thank you. Um, are you aware of any other mechanism? Um, there's also thought to be a more non-specific mechanism that causes swelling of the phospholipid membrane and also stops um, conduction of nerve action potentials. Okay, thank you. Um, can you tell me what different groups of local anaesthetics do you know about? There are two main groups, and they're the esters and amides. All right, okay. And how do they differ from each other? Uh, they're classified according to their chemical structure. Um, all local anaesthetic have a lipophilic uh, proportion and a um, hydrophilic. And the link between those two groups is the one that is, um, determines the group they're in. Are you able to demonstrate this for me? Okay, so we've got the aromatic ring, which is common to all local anaesthetics. terminal amine mm -hmm. and in esters linkage is as follows okay. and in amides amide group and another oxygen okay fantastic can you give me a couple of examples of um, local anesthetics in each group please Aster anesthetics are um, methacaine, cocaine, and procaine, and amide anesthetics are pipivacaine, ropivacaine, pralocaine, lignocaine. Okay, thank you. Um, can you tell me how some of the local anesthetics vary in their pharmacological and clinical properties and explain why? Okay, there's different things to talk about. There's the lipid solubility, the protein binding, and the PKA that determine clinical effects. Okay, well, let's start with the PKA first. Can you tell me what PKA means? PKA is the pH at which the drug exists in unionized and ionized uh, form in equal proportions. Mm -hmm. All right, okay, and how, how is it important for us? Uh, each drug has its own PKA. Um, all local anesthetic are weak bases, so at physiological pH they mainly exist in their ionized form. Mm -hmm. There's drugs with lower PKAs, um, as for instance lignocaine, um, that have more unionized drug available at physiological pH and therefore more drug can diffuse through the nerve membrane. Right. Are, you aware of any, are you aware of any equation that describes this relationship? There's the henderson hasselbalg equation that describes the relationship between PKA and pH. Right. Are you happy to draw it for me? It can be written in different forms. Okay. Um, so the logarithm of base to its conjugate acid equals PKA minus pH. Okay, so if we uh, take lidocaine, for example, how will that Lidocaine has a PKA of 7.9. Okay. okay. Um, and physiological pH is 7.4 usually. So there's a difference there of 0.5. Mm -hmm. um, whereas, for instance, the pivocaine has a pKa of 8.1. Okay. 7.4, there's a difference of 0.7. Right. So a large proportion of the pivocaine will be ionized compared to the Okay, thank you very much. And you mentioned protein binding and lipid solubility. <coughs> what does that determine? Protein binding determines the um, duration of action of the drug, so the more protein-bound drugs such as papivacaine or any amides mm -hmm. compared to esters will last longer than less protein-bound drugs. Right, and okay. Lipid, sorry, lipid yeah. solubility um, determines the intrinsic anesthetic potency of the drug, so more lipid-soluble drugs, again, like papivacaine, um, are more, po more potent and therefore exist in weaker concentrations such as 0.1 to 0.5 percent. Right, okay, thank you very much. Uh, can you tell me a little bit about the metabolism of local anesthetics? How are they metabolized? The metabolism varies between the groups. Esters are very rapidly hydrolyzed and inactivated by plasma cholinesterases. 
except for cocaine, who um, which undergoes um, hepatic hydrolysis. Right. Whereas amides are metabolized by hepatic amidases, and that process is slower and also depends on hepatic function. So they can be prone to accumulation, especially if there's continuous effusions running. Okay, thank you. Uh, what do we mean by the term differential block? Differential block refers to the fact that different nerve fibers are affected at different speeds by local anesthetics. Okay. There's a couple of mechanisms uh, thought to be underlying. Um, temperature and pain fibers that are small and myelinated fibers mm -hmm. get blocked mm -hmm. more quickly by local anesthetics. Um, and there's also the um, phenomenon of frequency dependency, which means that um, local anesthetics are actually only able to enter the axonal membrane when the sodium channels are open. Mm -hmm. And again, smaller fibers, such as for pain and temperature, have higher frequencies of sodium channel opening as opposed to large motor fibers. All right, okay. Um, can you tell me about the clinical signs of the local anesthetic toxicity, please? Local anesthetic toxicity affects the central nervous system and the cardiovascular system. Mm -hmm. Usually, central nervous system effects are um, apparent earlier. So patients might complain of uh, circumoral tingling, tinnitus, um, twitching. Um, this is followed by an excitatory phase where they can proceed to have granular seizures and then later on uh, go on to coma and respiratory arrest. Mm -hmm. Cardiovascular toxicity manifests itself by hypertension and arrhythmias, which can be bradyarrhythmias with wide QRS and long PR um, intervals, um, and re-entry tachyarrhythmias, and that can also then lead to cardiac arrest. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, um, can you tell me how does the pulse oximeter work, please? Okay. The pulse oximeter is a non-invasive device that we use in uh, anaesthetics to measure oxygen saturations. Um, it consists of a peripheral finger probe um, a, and a processing unit and a display unit. Mm -hmm. The um, finger probe contains two light emitting diodes that send light through the chosen tissue and a photo detector on the other side. All right, okay. And um, what are the wavelengths? You mentioned the two diodes that emit in light. Do you, do you know the wavelengths? That they There's are one that sends light in the, in the red spectrum and one in the infrared spectrum. All right, okay. They, they what sort of wavelengths are we talking about? Uh, the red one is 660 nanometers and the infrared one 940. Okay, and do they shine this light continuously? No, it's sh shown in intermittently um, through the chosen tissue. Okay, oh, at what sort of frequency? I'm not sure about the exact number, it's a high frequency, yeah. All right, okay. Uh, can you tell me why are these two particular wavelengths are chosen? They're chosen because oxyhemoglobin and deoxyhemoglobin differ in their absorption spectrum of light. Um, mm -hmm. Oxyhemoglobin absor absorbs most at um, infrared light spectrum and deoxy at the red, in the red area. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Um, uh, uh, what is the isobestic point? The isobestic point is at 800 nanometers, and it's at that point that both oxy and deoxyhemoglobin absorbed the same amount. All right, and what is the importance of this isobestic point? Um, I'm not entirely sure. I don't know of any clinical relevance of that. Okay. All right, okay. Um, are you able to put on the graph and the, um, the rep representing the different light absorption for oxygenated hemoglobin and deoxygenated hemoglobin. Mm -hmm. So we've got wavelength in nanometers <coughs> and the absorption coefficient. Okay. <coughs> and we said two wavelengths are 660 and 940. Oxyhemoglobin absorbs the most light at 940 nanometers, mm -hmm. whereas deoxyhemoglobin absorbs the most at 660, and this would be the isobestic point at 800. All right, okay. Um, are you aware of any law that describes the, this um, relationship? <coughs> uh, there's the Beer Lambert law okay. um, that describes the transmission of monochromatic light through a transparent substance. Mm -hmm. 
the Beer's law states that the intensity of light um, decreases exponentially with increased solute in the substance. Mm -hmm. And Lambert's law states that the intensity of light decreases exponentially with the distance travelled through the substance. All right. And uh, is there a formula for this law? Um, I'm sure there is, but I, thought I wouldn't be able to okay. write it down. Not to worry. Not to worry. Um, can you tell me what are the potential sources of error and limitations of this technique? Mm -hmm. And is there any problems with it? <coughs> yeah, in clinical practice, sometimes it is difficult to detect a, an actual pulse um, when people are very hypothermic or they constricted, so the pulse tile component okay. um, is lost. Uh, sometimes we can get movement artifact or electric interference in theatres and also sub substances such as nail varnish can interfere and give false readings. Yeah. Any nail varnish? Um, I, th I think mainly dark nail All varnish right, to okay. my knowledge. Okay, yeah, that's fine. Any other problems? Um, I know that um, other forms of hemoglobin can okay. interfere. Um, like for what? instance, carboxyhemoglobin um, has a similar absorption spectrum to oxyhemoglobin mm -hmm. and therefore gives falsely high readings. All right, okay. Um, and in contrast, methemoglobin absorbs equally um, in, in the red and infrared spectrum and gives readings around 85%. Right, what about fetal hemoglobin? Fetal hemoglobin. I'm not aware it makes any difference. Okay, that's fine. Um, any other problems you're aware of? Uh, pulse oximetry, like any other measuring device, uh, is reliant on clinical interpretation uh, because it doesn't give any um, information on adequate ventilation. So the patient could right. be um, well oxygenated but actually be retaining CO2. Okay. Okay. Or equally, an anemic patient could be very well oxygenated but not deliver oxygen to the tissues right. appropriately. Okay. Well, um, you draw this, this graph before. Are you able to put the um, carboxyhemoglobin and methemoglobin absorption um, on this graph? Okay, um, I can try. I said that um, carboxyhemoglobin is similar to oxyhemoglobin, mm -hmm. so I would imagine it's somewhere along that line as well. Mm -hmm. And methemoglobin, I said, absorbs equally at both wavelengths. Um, I'm just not I'm entirely sure where along the graph it would lie, so I would just be guessing. Okay. Okay. Many thanks. Thank you very much. Okay. Um, can you tell me how is oxygen carried in blood, please? Oxygen is mainly bound to hemoglobin in blood and gets carried that way. Okay, in what sort of percentage it's carried to, is oh, um, bound to hemoglobin? I think it's about 80%. Okay, and uh, what about the rest? Um, that's dissolved just in plasma. Right, so uh, you're saying that 80% of hemoglobin is bound to, um, oxygen is bound to hemoglobin and 20% dissolved in plasma? Yeah. yeah. Okay, okay. That's fine. Um, can you tell me about a little bit about the structure of hemoglobin? What does it consist of? Um, hemoglobin is a large protein molecule. Right. How large? Um, I don't know. Okay. Don't know. All right. Um, okay. That's fine. And it, I think it has four subunits and um, it has a central iron. iron. All right. Okay. Uh, just one iron? Um, I think there's one for each subunit, so right. I think it's four all together. Four all together. And what do these subunits consist of? Um, it, there are different chains, um, and I know that they differ for different forms of hemoglobin. Yeah. So, for instance, the adult hemoglobin mm -hmm. um, has two alpha chains and then two um, gamma, gamma mm. chains. Mm. All right, and um, how does it? differ from fetal hemoglobin? Uh, fetal hemoglobin has uh, different chains and it's called HBF um, mm -hmm. as opposed to HBA um, and the chains are uh, 2 alpha and 2, I think it's 2 gamma for the fetal actually. All right. um, so I, um, can I correct myself in yeah, the adult? Okay. I think the adult is um, 2 alpha and 2 delta chains. And the fetal is? 
to alpha. to alpha and to gamma. All oh, right. Okay. And um, what else apart from this different from the adult hemoglobin? Um, fetal hemoglobin um, carries oxygen very well. It's got a high affinity for oxygen to mm -hmm. ensure oxygenation of the fetus. Yes. And why is that? Um, because the once the feet, once the um, cord is cut, the fetus needs yes. a lot of oxygen. And how does it achieve it? Um, it just binds very avidly to the oxygen. To, due to what? Um, I don't know. Right, um, okay. Have you heard of the 2,3 DPG? Oh, yeah, yeah. All oh, right, yeah. okay. What was that? Um, it's a substance from um, a um, process, um, and I can't remember what it stands for. Um, mm -hmm. But I know that fetal hemoglobin has a lower affinity than adult hemoglobin for 2,3 DPG, and I, I think perhaps that's why it binds oxygen better. All right, okay. Uh, can you tell me a little bit more of how does this saturation of hemoglobin occur? Um, oxygen binds to the iron, iron of the hemoglobin. Mm -hmm. So one molecule of oxygen per, per each iron iron. Yeah, so it's so four molecules of oxygen per hemoglobin. Okay. Right, okay. And how does it do it? Can you elaborate on that? Um, it's, it's reversible. So, so, um, hemoglobin is then able to offload um, the oxygen again. Yes. And how um, does it happen? Um, it, it just... Um, In, in, is it chemical? Is it a chemical reaction? So is it an oxidation of the um, it's not iron? No, because that would be more permanent. It's it's just um, bound and, and changes the structure of the hemoglobin molecule. Yeah. Molecule. In, in what way? Um, I know that there's a, a tight and a re relaxed form of um, hemoglobin, right. depending on whether there's oxygen attached to it or not. Yes, okay, that's fine. Uh, tell me, what, what is the oxygen dissociation curve and what's the importance of it? Um, Perhaps I you can draw it on the graph. Drawing, yeah, nice. Um, I know it's the relationship of um, oxygen saturation and um, partial pressure of oxygen mm -hmm. in the blood. Um, right, so where is the so saturation? Uh, the saturation is along here, or um, I'm not sure now. Um, I think saturation is up uh, here. Probably there, okay. Yeah. And then the, the partial pressure of oxygen. Okay. And the curve is a sigmoid shape. Okay. And why is it a sigmoid shape? And why is it important that it's a sigmoid shape? Um, <coughs> I've never really looked into why it's a sigmoid mm -hmm. shape. I, mm. I just know from revision it is. Mm. Okay. And um, there are certain factors that move this curve to the right and to the left. Can you tell me uh, oh, yeah. some um, examples of those? There's several factors that can cause a right or left shift. Um, I've already mentioned the 2,3 DPG and if there's an increased amount of 2,3 DPG a right shift will occur. Mm -hmm. And equally um, a left shift with decreased amounts of 2,3 DPG. Mm -hmm. Okay. Any um, other factors? I know that um, the same goes for temperature, so raised temperature causes a right shift and decreased temperature a left shift. Okay. Anything else? Um, I'm sure there was others. Um, I just can't remember at the moment. All right. Okay. Um, are you aware of a um, Bohr effect? Um, Why is it important to us? The Bohr effect um, this describes the... Um, change in oxygen affinity um, with changes in pH. Right, and how does it, what, what does <coughs> it say? It's to do with offloading of oxygen, so for instance in tissues, um, with, um, in acidotic tissues with yeah. higher uh, um, hydrogen ion concentration, um, there will be a left shift of the oxygen dissociation Okay, curve. so there will be less offloading of oxygen. Yes, I think so. Okay. Okay. Many thanks.